So uh, a few days ago, Lent began on Ash Wednesday. And Ash Wednesday is a very special time, especially in the life of a pastor, because we get to do some really special things on Ash Wednesday. I get to hold this little tray, and Pastor Heather's over there holding her tray, and there's oil and ashes that are mixed in it. And you all start to walk forward, and one by one, I put my finger into the ashes, and I mark a cross on your forehead, and I say, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And then the next person comes in line, and I put my finger in the ash, and I say, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And one by one, we remind us that we are going to return back to the earth in this mortal body, that there's something spiritual within us that's going to return to God, but that we're mortal, but that cross means something. And then, Pastor Heather and I switch sides for communion. And then I commune this side of the congregation, she communes that side, and everybody comes walking up, and I look at every cross that she created, and I hand that person the body of Christ. And then they go, and they get the blood of Christ, and they go on back to their seat, and the next person comes up, and I look at that cross on their forehead, and I hand them the body of Christ, they receive the blood of Christ, and they go, and they sit down. And then after worship, Pastor Heather and I will come together in our office, and we'll talk about who had the best cross. <laughs> I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm just teasing, I'm teasing. I will say this, though, that a large forehead makes for a really good canvas. Yeah. Okay, so seriously, the cross is a pretty important aspect because that's not the only time that we place a cross on a forehead, is it? You may, you may recognize, and I'm going to get to that one right there, Rochelle. You may recognize that uh, uh, when children come forward... Uh, for, for communion if they haven't received first communion instruction or even adults when they come forward and they're not ready to take communion yet that's fine all are welcome at the table but they get a blessing and I say the same blessing every single time I mark a cross on their forehead and I say you are a beloved child of God and into his arms you will return when I go into hospital rooms and I sit with people that are sick or suffering I, we pray and afterwards I mark a cross on their forehead and I say remember you're a beloved child of God and into his arms you will return after worship, sometimes in the first of the month, we have uh, prayers for anointing and health and well-being, and I'll have a little jar of oil up here, and people will come forward, and I'll pray for them or whatever's going on in their life. Afterwards, I'll put a cross on their forehead and say, remember that you're a child of God, and into his arms you will return, because this all stems from right here, the baptism. That's right, Rochelle. It stems from our baptism. We Children come forward, and families come forward, and adults come forward to be baptized, and we baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son. <laughs> And of the Holy Spirit. And afterwards, I take a little jar of oil. And I put my finger in the oil. And I mark a cross on the forehead of that individual. And I tell them they've been marked with the cross of Christ forever. They have been claimed in the waters of baptism. And that's where it all stems from. Today, our gospel lesson is focused all around this as well. And we've heard this gospel before just a few weeks back. We're back into the first chapter of the gospel of Mark. I know. I thought we were done with it too. But we're not. We've jumped right back into the Gospel of Mark, but this time we have these three stories that come back to back to back, and you can't read one without the other. We have the baptism of Jesus, the temptation of Jesus, and the proclamation of Jesus. And you can't talk about the temptation without talking about the baptism, and you can't talk about what he first says without talking about the temptation, without talking about the baptism. You follow me on this? All right. So Jesus is baptized by going down to the Jordan where John is baptizing people. And as soon as he's baptized, he comes up, and our scripture tells us that the heavens were torn apart, and then the Spirit descends like a dove, and there's this booming voice, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. Jesus is claimed as God's beloved son in the waters of baptism. He is named and affirmed and claimed at this point. But some other interesting things happen at this baptism that, that, that's pretty profound for Mark. That phrase, the heavens were torn apart, that's a violent action being torn apart. We get the word schizophrenia from the same Greek as torn apart. The other time that Mark uses this is in the, is in the crucifixion when the temple curtains are torn in two. Mark's pointing us towards something that's about to happen in the future of this man's life, and it's inaugurated at his baptism. It's a pretty amazing uh, 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 image to have that it's being torn apart. A scholar says that all of a sudden the distance between heaven and earth is invisible now. And now God is with Christ and the Spirit's descending. They are all there together in this one perfect moment and he is named. 
I went and looked at the other Gospels to find out if they use this as well. And Matthew and Luke say, the heavens opened. It's lovely. It's nice. But it's not being torn apart, this ripping, this tearing. And John doesn't even mention this at all. So here we have Father, Son, Spirit being established as heaven and earth. There's no separation between the two of them. And he is claimed and named in the waters of baptism. And then he is thrust out into the wilderness by what? The spirit that he just received. I thought the spirit was nice and sweet. No, this spirit is like kicking him, driving him, thrusting him, throwing him out into this wilderness. And how many days is he out there? 40 days. Any other stories about 40 and wildernesses? Yes, the Israelites traveling 40 years in the wilderness. And then it says that he's tempted by Satan. And there's these wild beasts. Are there any other stories in the Bible about being tempted and wild beasts? Yes, the story of creation. Mark is taking us on a beautiful journey, not only to the crucifixion and resurrection, but all the way back to the beginning of time where Jesus is inaugurated. Not only is he named and claimed in baptism, but he is, he is now authorized to go forward and proclaim this message. The angels wait on him, and the first thing he does is proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. It's been torn apart. It's right now. The kingdom of heaven has come near. And he says, repent and believe in the good news. This is the same message that every prophet shares. Repent and believe, or better yet, return to the Lord. Return to the Lord. This story of Jesus' baptism reveals his nature as the Son of God, the perfect Son of God that's going on to do everything for us. And it's our story too, because the same thing happens to us. These same three things happen to us. We are baptized in the waters. Now, maybe like you, uh, uh, the heavens didn't tear open when you were baptized. I don't know. And I've done a lot of baptisms here, and it has yet to happen. Um, let's see. I don't know, but it has yet to happen. But we are baptized in the waters, and we too are claimed in those waters. Now, a lot of people like to equate baptism as I'm saved. I've been baptized, so now I am saved. And I think we have a mistake there because this is not like the Willy Wonka golden ticket where all of a sudden you reach in here and you're like, nope, not yet. Nope, not yet. I got it. I'm in. Yes, I'm in. No. That's happened for us 2,000 years ago. We've been saved. This is where we get claimed as one of God's beloved. We are named in this waters of baptism. We are claimed as one of God's children, just as much as Jesus was claimed as the Son of God. With you, I am well pleased. You are my beloved. We are beloved children of God. You can go ahead and make that cross on your forehead right now and remind yourself, I am a beloved child of God. Go ahead and do it. It's okay. You can touch your forehead. Yeah. And then we go on to be tempted, to be tested, which is the same Greek word, to test. Now, a lot of us think that if we're going to be tested for something, that means we're going to decide if I'm good enough because education has done that to us. When we take tests, we get a grade. And if you pass, you pass. If you fail, you fail. You have certain things that you have to get to. But that's not the testing that we're talking about here. The testing we're talking about here is like if you're going to test the water's pH balance or if you're going to test a rock and find out what material it's made of or, or a piece of metal you're discovering what its nature is, what it is built of, what it is, what, 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 what is it created to be. That's the test that's happening here. As we go out into the world, everything that we come in contact with, the tests, the trials, the temptations that we have, show our nature. And the truth of the matter is, our nature is selfish. That's our nature. Jesus' nature is selfless. But we're invited to participate in that. So we need Jesus. We need this perfect being to be in our life to guide us to the right decisions, the next right thing to do. Martin Luther would wake up every morning and make the sign of the cross on his forehead. And then he would say the Lord's Prayer. And I got to tell you, I heard about this when I was a kid and I was like, man, how corny, how 16th century is that, right? You know, uh, Martin Luther is making this sign of the cross on his forehead and saying the Lord's Prayer. But as soon as you start reading that Lord's Prayer, you recognize that all he's after is just just today, be with me, God, today. I'm a beloved child of God. I've got to go out there and deal with the temptations of the world because I know you don't tempt me, but the world does and I do. So you need to be with me. Please be with me. Give me today my daily 
bread. Give me what I need today to deal with it. Help me to forgive as you have forgiven me. And I used to think that meant that if you forgive me, I'll forgive them. But it's, I'm going to try to forgive them the same way that you're forgiving me. And then it says, lead me not into temptation or deliver me from the time of trial. There are temptations all around us. God is not tempting us. We do the tempting. The world does the tempting. Our selfishness does that. We need Jesus. Our, our, it, the nature that's revealed in here is that we need this Christ, this perfect, perfect being. And then we're ready to go out and proclaim it. On Wednesday, Pastor Heather gave a really great sermon. If you haven't heard it, go on YouTube and listen to it about being gathered and scattered. And I wrote in my notes that, you know, we come together as a congregation at Abiding Presence and we gather and to seek God and serve others. And there's all kinds of great ways to do this. Worship and Bible study and Haven for Hope and instrument ensembles and choirs and all these wonderful ways for us to gather together to seek God and serve others. But then we go out into the world to proclaim what we have learned in here. That's the scattering. And that's when it gets hard. It's when we leave those doors. What is it? Six feet outside the door. I sometimes forget what I even preached about. You know, it's like we, we, we forget things. And we're invited to go and scatter and take the word with us in every corner, every nook and every cranny and proclaim that the good news of God is here, that the kingdom of God has come near. And we do so because we are beloved children of God. And so today, as you come forward to receive communion, I want you to dip your fingers in the water, participate with it, touch it, make that cross on your forehead to remind yourself that you are a beloved child of God. You are worthy. You are claimed. And now we're going to take communion together to take Christ onto us, to go out into the world, to proclaim it to others and everything that we say and do. It is not easy to do. We're going to get lost along the way, but all we need to do is just practice it just today. You are a beloved child of God, and into his arms you will return. What we do in the meantime is up to us. Amen.